Hello students, how are you? Very good morning. Welcome to today's topic, lecture number 19 in your theory. The title is Risk and Uncertainty. We are now living in uncertain times. Now we are in extended lockdown. We don't know. We are uncertain when this lockdown is going to end. The coronavirus, in fact, Chinese coronavirus or COVID-19, we used to call it uh, safely and politically correct. The curve of the coronavirus is yet to flatten in India. At the same time, your learning curve should go on in, in an increasing trend. Okay, so our university has started so many initiatives. You know, we are offering you classes. I feel that you are making use of all these initiatives. Apart from that, there are so many organizations, development, development agencies, who are hosting a series of webinars and classes online. Besides, we have uh, portals like edX and uh, Coursera, which offer massive open online courses, MOOCs, on a number of skills, most are free also. Then we have Google, who are offering digital marketing course, fully free. The, model is, uh, the module they are giving is very rigorous, 40 modules. It takes 40 hours to complete it. They're also serious in making you to participate. So I feel you can make sure of using all these avenues so that when you come back after lockdown, you'll be more knowledgeable. You feel more great about yourselves. Okay. Now, today's topic is lecture number 19 in your theory. It is risk and uncertainty. Well, this is the last topic in uh, production economics. So we have uh, farm management, production economics, and resource economics uh, in our course, in which we have covered farm management fully. And we'll raise it also later on. In production economics, this is going to be the last topic. Okay, risk and uncertainty. We are living in uncertain times, no doubt. Uh, so agriculture is also, since being governed by natural element, it cannot be left behind. Agriculture inherently has a lot of risk as well as uncertainty problems. Okay. We cannot totally eliminate all the risks, but we can manage it. Okay. So how to manage it? We have studied so many economic principles, right? We can apply it. Uh, for successful farm management. When you're able to manage your farm successfully, then automatically the agriculture sector can be managed really well. The production principles or economic principles that we have studied so far, they have two assumptions. The assumptions of certainty and timelessness. There is no time, there is no element called time, and all are certain. What is the certainty? For example, if the uh, urea is supplied 10 kg then the groundnut yield will be 10 kg that is certain right that is what we are assuming it but in real world we cannot have all these assumptions of certainty and timelessness so the economic principles operate in these circumstances of idealistic situations right where we have certainty where we have no time element so in real life we have both risk and uncertainty, they come under uncertain situations. So it was first Frank H. Knight who classified uncertain situations into risk and uncertainty. Why it is uncertain? Because we are not sure what we are going to get. If a farmer is supplying urea or potassium or phosphorus, he is not sure of what he is going to get as a produce. Even when he's very sure that if he's going for groundnut seed, if he's applying all the groundnut related package of practices, he'll be getting groundnut, no doubt. But it comes with a time lag. So we have time lag. But the assumptions in production principles are timelessness and certainty. But here we have time lag. But it is if we are sowing in the month of June, we'll be harvesting in the month of October, November, December, depending on the crop. So we have time lag. We cannot expect the results immediately. So we have time lag in agriculture. Okay. And we have inability to predict or forecast outcomes. We are applying all the fertilizers. We are giving all the pesticides, but we are not sure whether we will be getting produce or not. Or we may be sure, yeah, this is what we are going to get. But there is always something called probability. If you're expecting 100 kg of yield, we have a probability of it. You know, that one or uh, 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. If it is 0 0.6, then what? Then out of 100 kg, 60 kg is guaranteed, right? 
So we have time lag as well as it is not possible uh, for us to predict the outcome or it is not possible to predict the outcomes accurately with the probability levels. So that is why we have risk and uncertainty. So uncertainty is classified into risk and uncertainty and both are different from each other, right? How they are different. If you could see, when we explain risk, we mean a situation of perfect knowledge. When there is perfect knowledge, perfect knowledge regarding what? Perfect knowledge regarding all possible outcomes of a management decision. If a farmer is taking any management decision, he is having the possible, uh, the, he is having the perfect knowledge of all the possible outcomes. For example, if he is sowing groundnut seed, then he is very sure that he is going to harvest groundnut. If he is applying good quality fertilizers, he is very sure that the yield is going to be good, right? Like that he can have outcomes guaranteed. At the same time, the probability is very important. So the probability associated with each outcome. The farmer may expect 100 kg, but he'll be getting 20 kg. So the outcome along with its probability. So over the period of expertise and experience, a farmer will be having a good idea or those who are into farming, the professionals, they'll be having idea of what the out outcome can be and what will be the probability of outcome. So in risk, we have perfect knowledge of the outcomes. Outcomes of what? Outcomes of all the management decisions along with the probability associated with each possible outcome. Okay, that is why risk is measurable. We can measure risk. And if you are able to measure risk, then it is insurable. Uncertainty, earthquake. Earthquake, nobody can expect earthquake. Now, for example, we don't know what will come tomorrow. What will come after one year? We don't know, right? So earthquake is an uncertainty, right? We cannot expect the outcome and we cannot say with conviction, the probability of the earthquake to occur after one month or two months, like even storms, cyclones, whatever. Uh, but risk, for example, the incidence of pest and disease. Hmm? If you're able to say, if vegetation grows beyond this level, there is a chance for the pest and disease attack to occur. This is the probability, 0.4. That is 0.4 probability level of pest and disease incidents to occur if the vegetation grows beyond this extent, right? Like that we can measure risk. So we can ensure risk, right? But we cannot ensure uncertainty because we cannot measure uncertainty. Why? Because in uncertainty, it refers to those situations of imperfect knowledge like a quack where we don't know the outcomes, where we don't know the probability of outcome, then we don't know both outcome and their probability. Outcome and its probability, right? So this is what the basic difference between risk and uncertainty is. Risk is measurable, uncertainty is not measurable. How come risk is measurable? Because in risk, we know the outcome of management decision along with the probability of the outcome. In uncertainty, we don't know the outcome as well as the probability of the outcome. That is why uncertainty is not measurable. When something is not measurable, it is not possible for us to ensure. So risks are measured through probability concepts, right? Now this chart, if I could make it big, you see, this chart, it gives a fine picture of what is risk uncertainty. In terms of knowledge, risk has perfect knowledge. Farmers will have perfect knowledge, right? That this is the pest. If this pest occurs, and if you are not able to control within five days, then this will be my economic loss. Right, like that the farmer can have some calculation. Uncertainty, imperfect knowledge. For example, all of a sudden, if you have locust, which happened in North Gujarat, no? all of a sudden, we, if we have some locust attack, we don't know, no? because we don't know whether locusts are going to come or not. Right. Then outcome, outcome is somewhat known, it is totally not known. Right. Then probability, known, the probability of uncertainty is not known. Then measurement, risks are measurable, uncertainties are not measurable. Insurance, Yes, risks are insurable. Uncertainties are not insurable. An example, we can say uh, in risk, we have both positive risk as well as negative risk. What positive risk? For example, if the farmer is uh, adopting any new technology, it is also risk, right? Because the farmer doesn't know whether the technology is going to yield results or not. If he is going for greenhouse cultivation, 
right? He has to invest some 10 lakh rupees. The farmer, despite of not knowing what is going to come, he is ready to take a risk. Because if you want to have higher returns, then we have to make risks. Without risk, there is no return, right? So risk can be classified as negative and positive. For example, fixed capital investments, like investments in farm building, investments in um, uh, tractor, power tiller, investments in greenhouse technologies, investments in protected cultivation, all are positive risk. Because the farmer is taking a risk, he is calculating it, that if he is doing his job properly, he'll be getting good income. If he needs to improve his income, then he has to take risk. Then we have negative risks, like for example, incidents of present disease. Why negative? Because they have the chance of decreasing the farmer's income, right? Shortfall in rainfall. Because if there is rainfall shortage, the farmer's income as well as farmer's yield, subsequently everything will get decreased. So negative risk. Monsoon failure, drought are all negative risks. Now coming to here, example of uncertainty, we have implications of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Chinese coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. We have so many implications, right? The major implication is supply chain breaks. You know, supply chain uh, in some areas, we are rectifying it, but there is breakdown of supply chain. The farmer have harvested their produce, they are not able to market it because the existing supply chain is completely broken. We need to, you know, immediately make some new supply chains, which the, all the governments are doing, but I'm saying this uncertainty because nobody expected. On before March 10, nobody was expecting lockdown. After March 10, everything changed, and we are now heading to 45th day of lockdown, uncertainty. Outbreak of avian flu, again from China, it came, right? Avian flu. Nobody expected the poultry industry, you know, they faced, um, you know, heavy damage because of avian flu. Then technology uncertainty. You see now here in fixed capital investments, it means it is positive risk because the farmer takes a risk of investing a huge amount into that uh, activity, like greenhouse. Uh, he doesn't know what is going to come, right? So it's a risk he is taking, a positive risk. At the same time, it is also uncertainty in terms of technology. Why? Because if some technology is proven, for example, let us take hydrophonics, if it is proven in some areas, if you are trying to replicate the same in other areas, right? If it is not giving results properly, we don't know what is happening over there, right? The same technology, which has given good results in some area, if it is not getting replicated in other areas, there we have technology uncertainty, right? So we have risk, we have uncertainty. Now, I think we understood what is risk and what is uncertainty. Risk is outcome is known, the probability associated with outcome is known, right? Uncertainty, the outcome, as well as the probability associated with the outcome is not known. Thereby, we can measure and ensure risk. At the same time, we cannot measure and we cannot ensure uncertainty, right? And we have examples, examples like Chinese coronavirus pandemic. It's an uncertainty. At the same time, the pest and disease, which regularly occur, is a risk. Then we have some terminologies. First is issue. A risk which has already occurred is considered an issue, right? For example, the incidence of mealybug in papaya. Yeah? I have seen it actually. Uh, so if it is occurring every year, it's a risk. It becomes an issue. You know? Pink bollworm in cotton, it becomes an issue. Then opportunities. Posture risks are called opportunities. Why opportunity? Because a farmer has to look for some opportunities. He has to keep himself uh, you know, updated with all the latest technologies so that he can remain float in agriculture activity. Otherwise, nah, he won't be able to do anything good and he won't be able to maintain his terms of trade. In other sectors, if the income is rising, increasing, it's because they are keeping themselves updated, I feel. In agriculture, if the farmers are not keeping themselves updated, they are not going to get any higher income on par with other sectors, right? So the farmer has to look for opportunities. Opportunities are also risks, okay? Then risk appetite. Amount and type of risk that the farmer is prepared to seek, accept and tolerate. What is the risk appetite? For example, greenhouse cultivation, he has to wait for three or four years. Then only he can have some break even, right? If the farmer is establishing orchard, he has to wait for five to six years to have some break even, right? We cannot expect the very next year itself. 
that the uh, risk which you have taken should give some results. No, it is not possible. The farmer should be ready to seek, accept, and tolerate. Seek, seek help. You know how much he is ready to go and seek help, guidance from others. Accept whatever suggestions being given by experts who are known in their field. The suggestions should be accepted and incorporated by the farmer and tolerate. If the results are not coming instantaneously, the farmer has to tolerate. That is what is risk appetite. Then risk tolerance. The farmer's readiness to bear the risk treatments in order to achieve his objectives. If the farmer's objective is to have safe uh, as well as high income oriented you know, food products, safe as well as high income oriented food products, then the farmer has to bear some risk treatments. He has to go out of its com comfort zone. This is what is risk tolerance. Okay. So in risk terminology, we have issue. What is issue? If the risks uh, are repetitive every year, it becomes an issue. The risk which has already occurred or becomes repetitive is called issue. We have opportunities, positive risk. Risk appetite, it is the farmer's capacity to seek, accept, and tolerate. Risk tolerance, the farmer's readiness to bear risk treatments so that he can achieve his objectives. Okay. Then we have risk and returns. Risk is always associated with future course of events, right? Because we are sowing the seed today. And after six months, after eight months, after one year, we are going to get the results. And so a risk is always associated with future course of events because it is uncertain. If it is already happening, it is certain, right? It is uncertainty. Then greater the risk, there is always chance for return to be greater. Like in the case of any technology, the farmer is interested to invest. If he's investing, then there is possibility as well as risk for the farmer to get higher returns. Then a risk without return is suicide. You know, a farmer is investing. You take the case of uh, cotton farmers, especially BT cotton farmers, right? They have uh, some two or three years back, you might have read about the farmer suicides, especially in the Yabatmal area of Maharashtra. You know, because the farmers have invested so much in their cotton. Their cotton being the sole crop, right? They were not doing any other activity. They were not maintaining livestock. They were not diversifying their acreage. They were cultivating only cotton because cotton was giving them good price. There was also a good domestic market as well as international market. But when their risk of taking up cotton in their entire land holding did not give them any return, it became suicide, right? So risk can be minimized but not totally eliminated. Even though if you are spraying pesticides and insecticides, nah? that is why uh, we have been taught, now nah? we have to maintain the threshold level. If it is going beyond the threshold level, then only we should go for application of pesticides, you know, high-end uh, chemicals and all. If it is below the threshold limit, that is okay tolerable. That is what risk is all about. Risk can be minimized, but cannot be totally eliminated. Then risk can be managed really well and can be kept at a lower side. Then most important thing is risks are not inherently bad. They are not totally bad. Why? Because they are associated with returns. Risks gives you returns. Risks give you profits. So that is why risks are not default bad. Farmers as well as, you know, in general, we have to take risks. Then only we'll be getting good opportunities to have higher earning, higher satisfaction. Then, what are the sources of risks in agriculture? First is, we have here given six major sources. The first source is dependence on nature. Agriculture is totally dependent on nature. We used to read now vagaries of monsoon. Still India is to depend on man monsoon, vagaries of monsoon. So it is called production risk. Then human elements. In agriculture, we are using manpower to a greater extent, right? So uh, labor may be efficient, may be inefficient. A farmer, you know, he can take efficient decision, he can take inefficient decision, or the timing of decision may go wrong. So we have human as well as personal risk. Then markets. In markets, we do not know, right? What is the price that is going to be? We have price risk, we have market risk. And then government rules regulations, institutional risk. You know, all of a sudden, yesterday. 50 IRS, office, 50 IRS officers, Indian Revenue Service officers, they happened to submit a report which nobody asked. 
they submitted to media that there should be uh, you know um, increase in tax rate income tax rate of 40 percent you know right now it is something around 32 it has to increase to 40 percentage and then they also say that uh, the government should impose new cis like covid 19 cis who asked for all those things you know they are creating panic amid the pandemic so it is called institutional risk all of a sudden government can say uh, we are banning the export of wheat maybe government is acting as a welfare state but at the same time it is going to you know influence farmers right implicate farmers for example the farmer must have invested in his wheel in his uh, wheat crop he must have harvested he must have established some contracts you know their relationship go bad right because he is making uh, personal contacts and he is establishing some export contracts if the government is banning all the wheat exports all of a sudden then where will the farmer export even though it is being done in as a welfare state we have all these problems we have government rules and regulations that is called as institutional risk so we have production risk we have human risk we have price risk or market risk we have institutional risk and then we have financial risk you know why because still now the farmers are not having sufficient capital to run their business whether it is working capital or whether fixed capital you know even to run daily agriculture business they are dependent on loans that is good no problem because loans should be given to farming community whether capital loans or you know, crop loan no problem but there are problems of financial risk the bank may give or may not give the interest rate may change we don't know what is interest rate that is going to change or the bank may ask for some collateral some mortgage some pledge you know that is what financial risk and then we have business risk business risk is it is the aggregate of all the risk production human price institution except financial risk it's an aggregate of all the risk except financial risk now so we have production risk because why because agriculture is inherently dependent on nature we have uh, human risk personal risk because agriculture is completely managed by human elements then market risk because we don't know what will be the price of commodities as well as we don't know what is the price of input supplies like mancos or is available for 100 rupees after six months it may go 180 rupees 200 rupees who knows we don't know about the the price that is going to be incurred by the farmers for buying input supplies right and then we have government rules regulations creating institutional risk then uh, the banks may lead to financial risk bank or banking system or if the farmer happened to take loan from uninstitutional sources like money lenders relatives and all you know and the relative would have said you can give out a one year but all of a sudden the relative is asking tomorrow itself you know how is it possible for the farmer to manage so we have financial risk and then we have business risk which is nothing but it is a risk aggregate effect of all the four different risks which is institutional market human as well as production except financial because financial risk is not totally dependent on the farmer it is dependent on some other agency like bank whereas all other risks are directly influencing or getting influenced by the farmer's decision right it is the farmer's decision to produce a crop it is the farmer's decision to em <coughs> employ a labor sorry it is the farmer's decision to produce that crop and he is going he is going to take it to the market right and uh, the government if he is taking any decision the farmers are going to be influenced by it so financial risk is entirely different it is operating in a different plane that is why in business risk we don't have to take into account the financial risk also first what is production technical risk here in production risk is also called as technical risk so in production risk we have weather risk and technical risk there are two components of it what is weather risk changes in weather conditions leading to changes in production yeah. then what is technical risk changes in technology there may be variations in output okay depending on how the farmer is efficiently utilizing it the inefficiency of the farmer and when we have superior technology but the farmer is not able to efficiently use his resources then he will be going to get lesser output right so we have technical risk we have weather risk as two components of production risk for examples insect pest attacks monsoon vagaries you know non functioning of you uh, know breakage or non functioning of farm machinery at crucial times you know all these are production risk the farmer has uh, you know he has rented a land uh, laser you know laser leveler 
laser land leveler laser land leveler lll okay he wants to level his land properly and he has obtained it from punjab for example you know he has paid for the transportation expense he has paid for everything and he has brought over here all of a sudden the sensor in it is not working you know what you will do the sensor in laser land leveler is not working then what you will do risk but even then he has to take it because if that can level his land properly then there is possibility for him to get higher returns so he has to take the risk he has to go for it what he can do is uh, he can have some arrangement i'll be taking laser land leveler from you but if it is not working properly then i won't be paying it or i'll be paying only 50% of what some kind of arrangement some stop gap arrangement the farmer has to do or apart from having laser land leveler he should also have laborers on hold right you know he should tell them i'm taking a new technology but it's not working i think you should do the job like that there should be some kind of compromises that he has to make right then human risk personal risk the farmers and farm laborers who operate the farm may also become a source of risk of the farm as well as the farm profitability why because of you know there are so many instances like like prolonged illness death or non availability of laborer key management employee or labor strike happening right and then uh, disputes you know scuffles happening you know within farm farming families which may lead to disruption of farm work you know the farmer must have you know sown in one hectare of land there are two brothers if they happen to divide the land you know they will be doing right and uh, there will be one or two permanent laborers you know it is not possible for brothers to decide where the permanent labor should work there are so many things so we have uh, human elements so which are working agriculture they may also pose risk those risks are called as human risk or personal risk then we have price risk or market risk why because the changes taking place in markets there is variations in price you know or variation in buying behavior of traders may also act as risk sources you know uh, example we have price fluctuations and we have uh, price fluctuations of commodities that is harvested and uh, labor seeds fertilizer plant production chemicals plant growth promoters availability right for example the farmer may need uh, some good quality pesticide let us say some good quality pesticide the farmer is requiring it right if it is not available that is also market risk right the farmer knows very well that this is a problem that has occurred in his field and that problem can be controlled efficiently managed only with the help of that pesticide like corrosion for example but if the corrosion is not available then what he will do it's a risk market risk right okay it has got nothing to do with price the farmer is ready to pay the price but what if the product is not available that is also a market risk so price uncertainty as well as the uh, uncertainty regarding the availability of the inputs right and if he is taking to the market as produce if there are no takers again risk then we have volatility that is variations in output prices of both main product by product are also case of price risk so we have price risk and market risk price risk of both output as well as input supplies the farmer is not sure what price he is going to get and sometimes he is also not sure of what the prices of inputs are going to be right apart from the price factor which is a major source of price risk we also have the factor of availability suppose if the inputs are not available what the farmer will do he requires an input if it is not available that is also a risk that risk will come in market because the farmer has to purchase inputs from market market risk right then we have institutional risk changes in government rules and regulations these days you know, because of the uh, outbreak of this pandemic the government is changing rules you know all the state governments central governments because the first time we are we are experiencing such a big lockdown and we are changing rules every day you know beyond that we also have like i told you know we have 50 irs officers they proposed uncalled 40% plus tax and covid 19 says on more than 10 lakh per annum earners they had yesterday right mm. so all these measures are risks because why because it is creating panic already we have pandemic over the pandemic we have people creating panic if the panic is coming from institutional agencies we can say it as institutional risk 
because the panic is created by the institutional sources right for example apart from this you know uncalled example we also have some other examples like a uh, ban of export of agricomodities like wheat if the government is banning wheat exports those the welfare state is doing why welfare state because the government has to serve its uh, first citizens right consumers we are producers we are consumers if farmers started exporting wheat to other countries because uh, they are getting more money what about consumers over here whose uh, basic necessity is food like wheat and rice right the government has to compensate there is one more thing but here we can say then restricting movement of agriculture produce like during lockdown situations the farmers are not able to take their produce to apmcs agriculture you know produce marketing yards they are not able to take it over there so we have the movements which are restricted again risk imposing levy on certain commodities the farmers are you know producing some commodities the government imports tax on it you know why the government is imposing tax because the government doesn't want to promote the commodity for example you take in the case of punjab you know punjab the ground water is going down and down you know so now the government is proposing to go for some other crops some other crops like pulses instead of going for wheat or uh, rice which are highly water intensive crops all the rice is produced by like uh, andhra karnataka tamil nadu and all no? or odisha also so punjab can focus on wheat and rice instead of that they can diversify to some other crop if the punjab farmers are not listening they can become an incentive to switch over to pulse crop despite giving incentive and assured market if the farmers are taking the same rice crop then there can be some levy on it who knows that levy may force farmers to decrease the acreage under certain under some crop right then acreage restrictions like limiting the acreage of some crop the government will say in this area wheat should be cultivated one to this extent why because of during drought you know when there is no sufficient water for basic needs irrigation you know it takes up nearly 60% or 70% of water requirements the government can impose some restrictions restrictions in terms of acreage as well as quantity in uh, foreign countries like usa we have production limiting subsidies the farmers are given subsidies to limit production because uh, i don't know what practice they are doing it maybe highly efficient they will be having higher production more than the domestic need you know the farmer is producing things in surplus which is more than domestic need if that is the case what will happen uh, the government has to destroy food you know every year they are you know drowning tons and tons and tons of food items in the open sea why they are doing it because if the surplus is released in the market then it will bring the price down if the price is getting down then ultimately the farmers will be getting affected so to avoid that they are limiting production despite that if there are you know surplus production the government are the government in foreign countries i think still they are doing they are destroying the surplus production in the open sea they cannot introduce in the market because that will bring the price down i think the same happened in our case uh, during p uh, during uh, pl480 you know pl480 pl480 is you know during lahal bahadur shastri when he was the prime minister of india what happened was uh, we are facing famines we are not producing sufficient quantity of rice and wheat so we were requesting usa to donate us to actually give us the wheat which they were dumping in the open sea you know through public law 480 wheat it came from usa to india along with it we also had parthenium parthenium grass it also came along with the wheat from usa so i heard the usa was about to destroy the excess wheat you know in the open sea and then through pla pl480 we had wheat and then we had green revolution we became self sufficient in food production rest is history but even now the foreign countries are doing it either they are giving production limiting subsidies or despite that if there are excess surplus the foreign countries are destroying it because they want to maintain you know terms of trade you know if excess is releasing the market it will bring the food prices down if the food prices go down it may be beneficial for the consumers no problem but the farmers will be getting affected so a little inflation is also good we need to keep inflation at for example 6 to 7 percentage if inflation is becoming more than 10 percentage then nobody will be able to buy anything if inflation is 
less than 4 percentage then the producers you know will be at the receiving end they won't be able to earn sufficient income right then ban on production in some regions again it is a because the government is imposing ban so it is institutional risk then restrictions intended for resource utilization like the farmers will be advised not to go for bore well not to go for tube well install only drip irrigation facility because if they are using bore well tube well then they are exhausting the groundwater right then subsidy and taxation changes you know um, for example there last year there was 60 percent subsidy on certain items or 50 percent on certain items now the government has decreased to 40 percent 30 percent 20 percent or the government may also increase to 60 percent in some items the subsidy load so we don't know what subsidy rates will be if the farmer is deciding that i got one lakh rupees and i want to buy this power teller the government is going to give me subsidy of 50 percent uh, on it then all of a sudden if the government decreases 25 percent subsidy then the farmer won't be able to buy it so it is an institutional risk right then we have financial risk so here the financial risk increases with increased amount of borrowed money the farmer is borrowing more money from institutional or uninstitutional sources then it increases the financial risk so why it may arise due to changes in rate of interest for example when i had housing loan it was 8.25 percentage i had housing loan but now it is 8.65 percentage the interest rate are changing right then changes in institutional policy regarding lending to crop or enterprise you know the institutional policy you know for giving crop loans may also change for example they'll be having a limit 48000 rupees for cotton you know they may increase also next year 60000 for cotton or if they are giving crop loan to bajra next year they may say no bajra is not giving sufficient returns for the farmers so we won't be giving crop loan to bajra banks may say right then changes in repayment plans you know for example because of rising interest rate or decreasing interest rate there will be some changes in the repayment plans which are given by banks again financial risk then non institutional lenders right the, the farmer obtain loan from non institutional sources like money lenders relatives and all that they may insist the repayment in form of kind not as cash you know make the repayment as part of your produce for example in the case of cotton right if the farmer has taken loan from a non non institutional lender right and if the cotton prices are so good for example 80 rupees per kg for example he may insist instead of giving me in cash you have to give me in kind right the farmer has to accept in some cases because he may be having good relationship with them or next year the same farmer might have to be dependent on them so all these are financial risks okay then ultimately what we have is business risk it is the aggregate effect of production market and institutional risk right because all these risks influence the probability of the firm right business risk right is the risk which is faced by the firm independent of the way in which it is financed okay business risk is the risk of the uh, aggregate effect of all the risk except financial risk why because it is a risk faced by the farmer or any business firm irrespective of how it is being financed that is why financial risk is not productive it doesn't matter how it is financed okay the risk which is combined effect of production market institutional risk okay there is a risk which has got no influence by the matter how it is financed so that is why financial risk is not a part of business risk financial risk is separate business risk is separate are you getting it then we have risk management what is risk management risk management refers to identification assessment and prioritization of risk whether it is positive or negative we have to identify we have to assess and then we have to prioritize followed by coordinated and economical application of resources why to minimize monitor and control what the probability and or impact of unfortunate events or to maximize the realization of opportunities it looks a little complicated right now let me explain you see first risk management is what you have to identify 
you have to assess and you have to prioritize what risk risk should be identified after identification you have to assess it and then prioritize what is prioritization if you got 10 lakh rupees right uh, you need tractor or you want to establish greenhouse in your farm right now you have to identify and then you have to assess and then you have to prioritize which one you have to go first whether you want to establish a greenhouse unit or you want to purchase a tractor right so once you have made decision it should be followed by you see coordinated and economical application of resources resources are scarce and they have alternative uses for example labor if you have decided to purchase a tractor now you have to use your labor efficiently because labor have alternate uses for example if you are using your labor in running a tractor the same labor can be used in other activities like uh, spraying pesticides so you are sacrificing the activity of spraying pesticides and you are investing your labor in running a tractor right so that is what after taking decision you have to go for economical application of resources why so that you can minimize monitor and control the probability of an event okay as well as the you can realize the benefits of opportunities are you getting it so risk management is nothing but identification assessment and prioritization of risk whether positive or negative followed by coordinated and economic application of resources so as to minimize monitor or control the probability of an event or the impact of events altogether or to maximize the realization of opportunities both you have to manage risk at the same time you have to maximize the opportunities that can be realized from that risk okay so this is what is risk management so in risk management we have so many strategies first is risk mitigation then risk transfer third is risk coping okay what is risk mitigation that is action actions which you are taking to eliminate the risk altogether like you know crop diversification you know when you are diversifying you know you are not putting all your eggs in one basket you know you are not focusing on only one crop specialization you are diversifying the risk so if you are not able to earn sufficient income in one crop the loss in income is offset by the gain income of other crop diversification or you can also go for diversification of enterprises along with crop you can go for livestock so the, the, if there is a crop failure at least you will be getting some regular income flow from livestock risk mitigation then risk transfer the farmers can transfer the risk to a willing third party how come by insurance right you can insure your crops so because of you know production risk if there is any crop failure then you can claim your loss then risk coping apart from that the farmer can also uh, ensure that he will be getting some help from government sources you know some assistance to cope risks for example if there is uh, a monsoon failure you know it is also not possible uh, for the farmer to take any risk when there is a monsoon failure but the, then the government can have some assistance provided to the farmers right so we have risk mitigation strategies you know we have risk transfer strategies that is transferring your risk to a third party who is willing to take like insurance and then risk coping mechanism right uh, due to some risk event which is beyond the control of farmers the assistance can be provided by public agencies so that the farmers can cope the risk right then what are the methods of risk management here how many methods we have we have got five methods of risk management you know what is first one first is retain first method in risk management is retain it means take the risk take the risk after harvest the farmer can decide whether to store or whether to sell immediately if he is deciding to store then okay he is taking the risk because he is uh, with his expertise experience he is thinking that after three or four months he will be getting good returns but he may not also but at the same time he is taking the risk then shift it means what shifting your risk to a third party who is willing like insurance you know or the farmer after immediately after harvesting when he is selling his produce to a village trader what he is doing he is shifting the risk to the trader the trader is paying to the farmer right 
So after harvest, in his farm gate itself, the farmer is getting the price. It may be low or high, it doesn't matter. But what the farmer is doing, he is shifting the risk to the village trader. Now it is the responsibility of the village trader. It will be the duty also of him to take the risk and then to sell to some other, you know, you know, wholesaler or retailer in the supply chain. He'll be taking the risk. So the farmer can shift the risk. Or also he can shift the risk to in the form of insurance to a third party in the form of insurance. Right. And then reduce. The farmer can reduce the risk. Like we told, right? A diversification. The farmer can go for diversification. There are some pros and cons. If it is specialization, the farmer is taking a risk of specialization. If he's getting good harvest, followed by good prices, then he may get good income. At the same time, there is a crop failure. All his income will erode. So the farmer can reduce the risk in the form of intercropping. You know? If the farmer doesn't have irrigation, then he can go for irrigation facility, drip irrigation and all. Then he, he has to select resistant varieties. He has to secure marketing contracts like contract farming. If he is going for some crop like jerkins, you know, jerkins has got no market in Saurashtra or in Gujarat. It has got markets only in foreign countries, for example. If the farmer is taking up a crop like jerkins, then the farmer has to make a contract in a contract farming. He has to, otherwise he won't be able to sell it. So contract farming is a way of reducing the risk because he is shifting the risk to the contractor. Now the contractor on the basis of the contract that has, you know, happened between farmer and the contract farming owner, he has to take the produce, right? So the farmer can retain the risk. The farmer can shift the risk. He can reduce the risk or he can also go for self insure what is self insure that is he'll be having some savings from the previous crop you know that saving he can use it for example right now he is facing crop failure he doesn't have in a single penny in his account right now from this crop but yesterday it was a good crop bumper crop of the farmer and the prices were also high the farmer saved some money that money he can be used now to mitigate the present losses to mitigate the current loss the farmer can use his reserves that is self insure then avoid play it safe do not do anything doing nothing is a decision now doing nothing is also a decision in farm management decision if the farmer is deciding not to do anything then it is also a decision right so by not selecting any particular enterprise you know then uh, you know not going for you know a planting window after july or august not going for any extended planting window or uh, by declaring a crop holiday, no crop for the season or by not increasing the debt asset ratio. You know, the farmer has got some net worth. You know, the farmer can think, let me not decrease my net worth. You know, let me have more assets than liabilities. Let me not increase my liabilities. You know? So avoid. So the farmer can retain, he can shift, he can reduce, he can self-insure, he can avoid, he can take all these risk management strategies or methods. <clears throat> then how to measure risk? As we told you, risks are measurable. Why? Because we know outcomes. We know the probabilities of outcomes. So when you know outcomes as well as the probabilities, you know, we can easily measure risk. Okay. So now the formula is, you see what? The formula is risk is equal to consequence into probability into exposure. What is consequence? Outcome. An outcome. Then Outcome means what? Whether uh, the farmer is going to get profit or loss. Outcome. Then the probability. It can be between 0 and 1. Then exposure. The activity the farmer is doing. For the said activity, what kind of outcome the farmer is going to expect and what is the respective probability? That is what the risk is. Okay. Now, we have got three different methods to measure risk. First method is the weighted average method where we have to find simple average as well as we have to find the weighted average. If the weighted average happens to be more than simple average, then there is no risk. Then expected yield and average yield. The farmer has to find average yield and the farmer has to find the expected yield. If the expected yield happens to be more than the average yield, then there is no risk. Similarly, the farmer has to select that enterprise. It can be anything in the enterprise. Enterprises, any activity in farming that has the capacity to give economic returns enterprise you know we have crop enterprise like groundnut cotton maize wheat 
we have got livestock enterprise, we have got apiary enterprise, we have got poultry. So there are so many enterprises, right? So the farmer has to select that enterprise which has got lowest range as well as lowest variance as well as lowest coefficient of variation in terms of income. The income should have low range, the income should have lowest variance, the income should have lowest coefficient of variation. So by doing all these things, the farmer can measure risk. First, you see, estimating weighted averages. Now you see, we have different years from 2005 to 2015. We have got 11 years, right? And then we have got price, you know, the price rupees per quintal. For example, the average price of some commodity in 2005 is 1000 rupees. And then like in 2015, it is 1500. There are some variations also, 1600 and 2012, no problem. So this is summation, summation of all these prices. And here we have observations, 11 observations. So simple average is what? 1272, 1272.727. This is the average price, rupees per quintal for all these 11 years together. Now what you're doing, we are assigning weights. How weights are assigned? Based on some rationality. You know? We are assigning some weights. Here what we are assigning? You know, the more as the year progresses, the more the weight increases. So in 2005, the weight is one, then weight increases. In 2015, weight is 11. Then what you are doing, the existing price in that year is multiplied with its weight. And when we are multiplying it, you see here. So what we are getting, and then we are making summation. The sum is 88,200. And then what we are doing, we are dividing it by the weight. So what we are getting, we are getting 1336.364. So we have simple average, summation of Xi upon N, and then we have weighted average. You know? What we have, summation of Pi into, summation of Pi into Wi upon the W, right? Summation of W. So we have 1336, right? So now what we are getting here, you see, the weighted average, is more than the simple average. So if this is the case, then there is no price risk for the underlying commodity. So the farmer can come to a conclusion that there is no price risk for the underlying commodity. Uh, if the data are available in public domain, the farmer can make use of it or based on his experience. For example, he can take groundnut price from 2005 to 2015, what he actually got. Now he can decide in the year 2020, whether he wants to cultivate groundnut or not. And if he feels that, um, whether the price risk is going to be there or not, then he can you know, do a simple calculation like this. And if the weighted average happens to be more than simple average, then farmer can come to a conclusion. Then he can take his own decision that, yes, we can go for groundnut. There won't be any price risk. Like that, he can come to some conclusion, right? Then estimating expected values. Okay, how it come? So we have crop yield, you know, over the years, no problem. We have crop yield over the years or the farmer can take crop yield of uh, neighboring farms also. So we have the average of it. 13 is average, 13 uh, quintals per acre crop yield. And then we have probability, you know, somehow using some rationality, we have assigned probability like we have 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.31. So this is one, the probability which you are assigning it, right? And then when you are summing it up, it should be one because the probability exists between zero and one. If you're tossing a coin, zero. And if you're saying heads, if a tail comes, it is zero. If you are getting head, as what you said, it is one, right? Zero, one. The range of probability is zero, one, right? And then we have to multiply the probability and yield. What we are doing, we are getting multiplying it and we are getting 13.1. So this is the average yield and this is the expected yield. That is, we are multiplying the yield with the probability, it is 13.1. So what we are getting, the expected yield is more than the average yield, right? If that is the case, there is no yield risk. If the expected yield happens to be more than the average yield, there is no yield risk. If the, go to the previous one. If the weighted average of price 
happens to be more than the average price, then there is no price X. Okay, weighted price average, if it is more than simple price average, then there is no price risk. If the expected yield is more than the mean yield or average yield, there is no yield risk. Then we can also use variability to select less risky enterprises. How come we can go for range, we can go for variance, we can go for coefficient of variation. So we have to select that enterprise, okay, where the range is minimum. What is range? It is the difference between uh, highest and lowest possible outcomes. In one enterprise, the range will be 20. In second enterprise, range is 48. Third enterprise, the range, that is difference between highest lowest values. The range is 12. So we have to select the third enterprise because range is minimum. Similar variance. What is variance here? We are given the formulas, right? So this is a sample variance and this is what? Your population variance. You know? We have got both variance formula. What is variance here? Is nothing but the summation of squared differences of the variable from the mean. You know? So this is summation. This is x bar is mean. This is the uh, value of the variable. You know? So summation of squared differences of the underlying variable from its mean. You know? Or summation of squared deviation of the underlying values of the variable from its mean. So we have sample variance as well as we have what? Population variance. But let's focus on the sample variance. You'll be having X, you know, for example, yield. You have got 10 observations of yield for all the 10 years. 12 kg, 14 kg, 20 kg, 20 kg. We have the mean value also. You know, when you have the mean value and then XI means first observation, I can go on to 10. First observation, second observation, third observation, fourth observation, right? So when you're summing it up, okay, if you're getting uh, first enterprise, second, third, fourth, fifth, if you've got five different enterprises and you're finding the variance of all the enterprises, the enterprise with the lowest variance, that should be preferred. Similarly, we have CV, coefficient of variation, which is nothing but what we have here, sigma. Sigma is what? Standard deviation, right? If this sigma squared is variance, square root of variance is standard deviation. So standard deviation upon mean into 100. In the case of population, for sample, we have S, standard deviation upon X bar, mean into 100. So higher the percentage of CV, higher is the risk in common. Same thing, we have to find mean and we have to find the standard deviation. Just make a square of, uh, sorry, square root of variance. You'll be getting standard deviation. So here we can measure risk by three different methods. The first method is to identify price risk. We can go for weighted price average as well as simple price average, right? If weighted price average is more than simple price average, then there is no risk. Expected yield and average yield. If expected yield is found to be more than the average yield, no yield risk. And then about the selection of enterprises, we have to select enterprises on the basis of lowest range, lowest variance and lowest coefficient of variation, right? We know what is variance, right? It is the average of square differences or deviations from the mean of the underlying variable. This is the mean, this is the value of the variable, right? So squared differences or deviations of the underlying variable from its mean, right? Then in agriculture or in farming, how to reduce risk? We have got nine different steps. What is first one? Diversification. Do not put all your eggs in one basket, you diversify. If you have got one acre of land, uh, apart from cultivating cotton or ground, you also put in livestock. So if there is crop failure, now at least livestock can give you regular income. Stable enterprise. We have to make enterprises stable. For example, in rain, in uh, you know dry areas, you know, in rainfed regions, now, if it is possible, we have to go for irrigation source because irrigation source can make the enterprise stable, the farmer with sufficient water, now, or he can also have a pond or farm pond. He can collect water and he can do farming activity for little more than two or three months extra. Like so, the farmer has to make all the steps to make enterprises stable. Then crop and livestock insurance. The farmer can 
minimize production risk or technical risk or weather risk, right? When he is taking crop and livestock insurances, then flexibility. It is about the plan, farm planning. The plan, the farm planning should be flexible. You know that is the you know one of the characteristics of farm plan, right? It should be flexible because uh, if the farmer has you know limited enterprise, limited resources, the planning or the farm plan should be flexible that the resources of one enterprise should be transferred to the other enterprise in need. Okay, it should be flexible. Then spreading sales. The farmer has to spread the sales. Now, instead of selling the entire produce in harvesting, that is also a strategy, right? Shifting, shifting the risk to other person. But at the same time, if the farmer has to gain or he has to offset his losses, then, you know, to his best that is possible, the farmer has to spread the sales. Instead of selling all the produce, this entire produce after harvesting, the farmer can go for after one month, after two months, like that he can spread his sales. Then hedging, the farmer can go for hedging. What is hedging? Hedging is a financial instrument. Like uh, for example, if you're buying a car, right? What do you do? Along with car, you also go for car insurance, right? So car insurance is a hedge. Car is an investment. We are investing in buying a car. And then along with that, we are also investing in car insurance. Why? Because if there is any loss, economic loss, we try to safeguard. We try to safeguard us from the economic loss. So car insurance may not help us in avoiding the loss, but it can minimize the loss or it can safeguard us from the loss, hedging. So like that, the farmer can also go for a commodity market. You know, he can invest, right? Apart from doing his agriculture activity, he can take up uh, commodity markets and he can invest in commodity markets or in his field also. You know, he can diversify. Even diversification is a form of hedging because if he's in, instead of investing whatever money he has got in one crop, what he is doing, the farmer is going for two or three crops. So the loss from one enterprise is offset by the gain in other enterprise, hedging. Then contract farming for high value crops. The farmer has to go for contract farming because the crops are of a high value. It means the farmer has to invest more. It means the farmer is taking more risk. The farmer is taking more risk, then it should be rational enough to go for contract farming. Then minimum support price given by the government agencies. So we have CACP, right? Commission of Agriculture Cost and Prices, who recommend CAC, who recommend MSP to the, to the government. And the government, uh, after getting a recommendation from CACP, what it does, it looks at all the factors, internal factors, external factors, and then it recommends MSP. So the MSP should be more than the variable cost, at least, right? Whatever the farmer is facing, like uh, cost A. Now we say, we know, right? Cost A1, which should be more than the variable cost. So minimum support prices may risk, uh, may reduce risk in farming to some extent. Then increasing net worth. We have got all these, you know, strategies or methods to reduce risk. This is the best method, increasing net worth. The farmer has to focus in increasing his own net worth. You know, he has to increase, what is net worth? Assets minus liabilities, right? Liabilities are what? Loans taken. The farmer taking loan, he has to make all rational decisions so that he'll be increasing his assets. And when his assets increase, either in terms of money or in terms of capital, whatever, then his net worth will be increased. If his network is increased, then there is a chance for the farmer to minimize risk as well as to offset risk as well as to go for new investments beyond risk. So with this, we'll end the class, right? So as a part of this class, I have given self-assessment for you. You have to make all these definitions, right? You should be now knowing what is risk. You're clear, right? What is risk? We know, right? We know, the, we know what is risk, the outcome and probability. If you're knowing it, it is risk. Then uncertainty. What is business risk? What is risk management? What is risk transfer? You know? Then what is institutional risk? What is hedging? What is price risk? What is hedging? Hedging, hedging if you're taking, uh, if you're saying it as an economic instrument, it means what? Investing in two different options, which are totally different altogether. So that the loss in one instrument or loss in one option may be offset by the gain other option. Hedging. 
one good example is as i told you when we are purchasing a car we are also purchasing crop oh, sorry not crop car insurance why because car insurance is an investment that may uh, minimize the loss or it may safeguard us from the loss all right hedging is a kind of safeguarding policy right then price risk then we can also discuss all these questions uh, you make your own self assessment uh, right briefly source of risk in agriculture what are the sources which we have right from nature source to institutional source then risk management strategies in agriculture what are the risk management strategies we have seen now from diversification to net worth then how to measure risk risk measurement we have seen three, three methods right what are they first is weighted average method second is expectatory method third is less variability you know lower variability methods what we had we had coefficient of variation we discussed variance we discussed range all the three should be low and those enterprises which have low range which have low variance and low cv they should be selected because they have got lesser risk and then methods of risk management how farmers can or in general how to manage risk methods right uh, both these are different if i ask you what are the risk management strategy in agriculture the answer is different if i ask you what are methods of risk management then it is different right because we have got all these methods you see here methods retain shift reduce self insure avoid all these are methods and if i tell you in agriculture what are the methods of reducing risk then we have all these things from diversification to increasing net worth so thank you for thank you for your patience hope uh, you understood the concept of risk and uncertainty we'll meet you in the next class the next class will be on economic principles applied in farm management so again we are going to deal in uh, idealistic world we are going to deal with certainty and timelessness here we are dealing with uncertainty we don't know what is going to come as well as we have time lag in case of economic principles that are applied in farm management we are going to deal with certainty and we are going to deal with timelessness that is the beauty of economics where we can make so many assumptions in idealistic world and when we are adjusting it to real world then we'll be having some issues which we are going to solve when we do when we solve more issues economics you know becomes more and more interesting hope uh, to meet you all uh, stay safe and uh, enjoy your learning thank you